Welcome to Popcast Deluxe, your If My Editor Asks, I Hang Drywall of Weekly Cultural Review. I'm John Caramonica, a critic of the New York Times. I'm Joe Coscarelli. I'm a reporter at the New York Times. I'm Jelly Roll, and I am a singer. That is <laughs> that is right. And more. Songwriter. TBQH. Dude, glad to be here, man. First of all, if you're not up on Jelly Roll, get up on Jelly Roll. Jelly Roll is the winner of the CMA New Artist of the Year, yes, number sir. one. But that is one-tenth of the story. I passed out mixtapes. A little bit hip-hop, a little bit rock. Then I started doing shows. Big tours, baby! I've never seen someone climb this fast. Every record label in America started calling. Dare I say, it's a small and not even the most significant part of the story, because to me, when I think about Jelly Roll, I'm thinking about five to ten years ago. I'm thinking about 15 years ago. I'm thinking about Car Full of White Boys. Yes. Era post. Hey, if the words haystack means anything to you, yes. you know where this podcast is going this <laughs> week. Um, before we get into the big interview, obviously, new channel, youtube.com slash podcast. Hit that subscribe. Hit that like uh, for more of this. Because, like, why wouldn't you want more comments? Yeah, like, get in the comments. comments. Like, get in the at, comments. Honestly, and we yeah. see you in the comments. We see you doing yeah, dubious things sure. in the comment. Like, we're aware. I'll be trolling the comments on <laughs> this right. one. How about that? On this Jelly particular Roll, one, I will be spot. trolling the comments. Yeah. Get uh, in the comments yeah. with your favorite Jelly Roll freestyle. Yeah. Whoever says the ni the nicer thing you say, the more I comment back. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> phenomenal. We, we, we'll take it. Um, I am a YouTube user, by the way. Yeah. You, and you were early. Yeah. Early, Very early. Early to you. Or like, YouTube, you, you still YouTube? Oh, yeah. Oh, you yeah. still YouTube? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was very early to YouTube. I was, was one of the biggest blessings of my career was getting early to YouTube, but I still am very active on YouTube. And you subscribe, you'll subscribe to channels? Dude, I subscribe like to podcast. channels. <laughs> Just like you, and I will like, <laughs> comment. Yeah. I'll make sure to comment. Yeah. The comment's a big thing, man. Help the algorithm, it's dude. True. You know, Give us an old comment. A thumbs up and a comment helps a lot. One of the reasons <laughs> that you know a lot about YouTube is early in your rap career, a thing that you did that went low key viral, uh, and which I know from back in the day is the ten minute freestyle. Yes, you you, you referenced it at the beginning yeah. of this, which was I thought was really cool. Jelly roll sitting clean to the eye stall. Plus I still get money. Yes I ball. Every time I see your bitch gives me an eyeball. And if my PO ask, I hang drywall. <laughs> <laughs> so the 10 minute freestyle this is you had just come out of jail if i'm not mistaken yes sir so can you tell us a little bit about what year we talk in what frame of mind is jelly roll at that moment oh man dude we'll just say 2010 or 9 just for giggles and uh I'm wearing this goofy polo shirt because I just left my probation office. Mm -hmm. And my dude had bought a handy cam, Chad Arms, who I talk about to this day. We're still friends. He's um, And he's like, throws a beat on. And the, what you didn't see was it was kind of a cipher. That's why it wasn't 10 minutes straight. Was we were kind of, it was like five or six of us kind of spitting at each other. Yeah, I mean, dude, we rapped for an hour, mm -hmm. all of us, being six, seven dudes, like we were in jail still, you know? Mm -hmm. And then he went home and cut it up. And at the time, you know why it was a 10-minute freestyle? Speak on at the time, YouTube wouldn't allow you to upload a clip longer than ten minutes. Wow! So you had to you had to go to YouTube.com. You didn't have it on a phone. You couldn't go to the web browser and do it on your phone. When you at that era, I know you were freestyling in school. I know you're freestyling in jail when you were in jail. I know that you were teaching yourself to rap to be the best battle rapper and eventually to become a great song making rapper. Who are the people that you're looking at when you're 15, 16, 17? Because the South, look, this is a very rich era yeah. in the South for hip-hop. Dude, hip-hop. So what's around you, and you're oh. like, I want, I can see myself in this. Dude, when I'm 15, 16 years old, your shirt was the first thing. I waited to talk to you about your shirt. Cash Money Records dominated our mom-and-pop stores forever. Yep. No limit. I mean, dude, I remember I'm sitting in a juvenile uh, in the state building where they transition you from one group home to another, and they have the TV on BET. Yep. And I remember the the drop it like it's uh or the, it might have been the bling bling video mm -hmm. bling bling every time right I come around album. you say the bling bling right. and I remember watching uh, was that after you back it up and mm -hmm. and why, drop why? it like it's the, up. whatever that record was yeah, the video yeah. was on BET mm -hmm. and That's I back that ass up right yeah, with Wayne no. coming with Wayne coming in doing the was like, that bridge on, and yeah, outro good. it's right, yeah. the second half of that right yeah, yeah for yeah, sure yeah. but it was that era it was one of those videos it might have been the bling I can't remember the exact video but I remember watching it. 
on this TV in mm-hmm. a state building. Now, we're shackled. Kid, we're kids, you mm-hmm. know? And just, just being enamored by Southern rap, mm-hmm. like 8-Ball and MJG. I knew it. I knew it. 3-6 Mafia, mm-hmm. UGK, mm-hmm. Outkast, The Dungeon Family, um, The Ghetto Boys. Oh, yeah. I mean, dude, just the, everything... Even the earlier side of like Swisher House and Chameleon Air and Paul mm-hmm, Wall, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. we were just fixing to get our feet wet. Like we were putting out mixtapes, so we were using of course. every reference we could. Of course, the locals like Haystack, yep. who was even before that. You know what I mean, dude? I mean, he was in the Murder Dog magazine. Oh, you yeah. know, it's like, which was a really kind of Southern and, based yeah. thing. I think I first encountered that album cover because they would buy ads in double xl and buy ads in the stores and at that time especially for southern labels that didn't have publicity like traditional publicity weren't coming through the major label system the way that they would get noticed at least for people like us in new york i would like look in the ads in double xl and i'd be like how how do they have a full page ad and i never heard of them oh yeah and i go buy the record yeah and then that's how i learned about a lot of that stuff i remember being in jail and reading when they gave tech nine the cover of the double xl wow and do you remember i remember him on this big crate this like uh they had him sitting in a warehouse Mm -hmm. that him and travis o'gwen had and at that moment i remember thinking to myself it's possible like, because I, I couldn't relate to Master P and Cash Money because the music I made was always so different, even sure. though I loved what they did. Mm-hmm. So I didn't know how that my music fit in the landscape. But with Tech 9 I did. I was like, I get this. Mm-hmm. And that's a really interesting moment in the South and the Midwest. And so what was happening in these underserved hip-hop regions... Obviously, the South ends up becoming major label rap. It sort of takes the place of New York and L.A. in terms of the dominant sound. But all this stuff in the middle, some of that stuff is not getting picked up by the major labels. And that's where these independents step in. And that's, frankly, it sounds like a lot of the room for you as a rapper to really grow and develop was because of that alternate system. And let Jelly work the streets, because if rap don't work for me, I can get a bird for cheap. I know you heard of me. Come on, he's murder, and I will chop your ass up like it's a cheeseburger. Jelly, I'm- Take us back even further, because we jumped ahead to your teenage years. Like, when you're coming up as a kid outside of Nashville, like, what are you first encountering when you start to think about art as being something that you could make? I got to give a little backstory. That's mm-hmm. cool. I'm the youngest of four. So I'm the baby. Right. And we say the youngest of five because we had another one that was always there. I had zero control of the radio. Mm-hmm. When it was me and my big sister's car, I'm listening to whatever my big sister's listening to. Mm-hmm. When I'm in big brother's car, I'm listening to whatever big brother's listening to. I'm in dad's car, I'm listening to what dad's listening to. You know, so when I'm in mom's room, I'm hearing mom's music. So my mother loved like oldies, Motown, 90s country, Waylon Jennings, she like took pride in like the Nashville side of it because she was a bartender. So she felt like she knew all these people and these characters and attended to them because Nashville was really small back then. Mm-hmm. My father loved soft listening, songwriter music. He introduced me to Jim Croce, James Taylor, yep. jazz music. Like he loved really more soft listening, like uh, introspective music. Mm-hmm. Um, my sister was the rocker. She she wanted to be the standout in the house. So she was, her rebellious ways went from everything from Nirvana to Offspring to Metallica. Y'all know the era. Mm-hmm. Of course. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like this. Early, these, early yeah, 90s. For sure. Alternative. 100%. This is the stuff that I'm just getting Pearl Jam. I mean, she's just, you know, showing me all this stuff. And uh, then I had a brother who was straight gangster rap, dude. Oh, yeah. Too short. Easy E, the first three six mafia mixtape. Yeah, sure. And then the neighborhood was, you know, middle class poor. Mm-hmm. So there was a whole different thing happening out there, what music meant to that culture. Streets, yeah. So it was a very cultural thing too. So I think it was like I ended up in hip hop because it was the language of that neighborhood. Yep. And because I it resonated with me rather quickly. I understood the way to express myself in a rhythmic pattern. And I didn't right. think I could sing. My whole family sucked. We sang all the time together. We hung around in the kitchen. Dude, listen, I'm not bullshit. We'd put on records, and we sounded like a bunch of drunk alley cats. I mean, it was bad. But we'd sing to the top of our lungs together. We were like a radio family more than TV. Mm-hmm. I just assumed I sounded like because they all did. Sure. I was like, maybe we just all sound horrible. Mm-hmm. You know? So I never even tried to sing, and I just I understood hip-hop. When you were listening to that stuff, especially 8-Ball and MJG, UGK, 3-6, are you listening to it because it's like for the attitude or are you like, damn, MJG's a crazy storyteller, Bun's a crazy storyteller? Like what was really jumping out at you about that the stuff? The lyrics. Yeah. Man, the storytelling, the uh, 
and the feeling like, dude, I think about that old eight ball. Uh, Spend the time between wrongs and right. Traveling the trap to the morning light. The getaway left me no choices I had to find. My mom and dad were too young to raise me right. Mm -hmm. And I just remember You were drawn to the bluesy stuff. Oh, dude. Man, I just felt it in my spirit. It made me feel like when my mother would play, and this is such a dramatic reference point, but that's my life, right? Mm. When she would play Coward of the County or she would play Bette Midler's The Rose Mm. and we would all be in there just bawling, crying. And she's just like these. I, I tell people, I think I ended up writing Save Me because I've been trying to write the rose my whole life. All of this drinking and smoking is hopeless, but feel like it's all that I need. Something inside of me is broken. I hold on to anything that sets me free. That's fascinating because a lot of people don't think about that kind of Southern rap as sentimental. Yeah, they think of it as tough. They think of it as attitudinal. But no, they don't think no. of it as sentimental. But especially like when I think of Pimp C as a producer, for example, mm-hmm. Pimp C's making sentimental music. Dude. Always make it sentimental. You know, one day you're here, the next one day you're here, baby, and then you're gone. Like these records, I'm tired of living. F- up. I'm tired of living bad. I'm tired of hearing grandmama say, when you'll go to church, Chad. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like, these were like, we were living that. Yeah. Like, you know, like these records were just like, they were the soundtrack to our life. Mm-hmm. You know and what I mean? I grew up in the South also, and I feel like people don't understand the idea of like a pickup truck with the stars and bars blasting southern rap music mm. like that it seems Man. incongruous to people but especially talk, up here yeah, yeah. Up, up in people new york especially yeah. like coastal liberals expect those cultures to be at odds yeah. when really they're not so different yeah. not at all man it's um hip-hop has been you know the sound of the south for me since i was a child and i'm going on 40 mm-hmm. so we've seen it live you know what i mean uh newer hip-hop is struggling i think to find its way but I think it will. I mm-hmm. think it's just like every other genre struggled to find its way at mm-hmm. some point in time. And then when you get into your teenage lifestyle, like, w- were you, was this music the soundtrack to your extracurriculars? I think I was more drawn to the streets for like an option out. Mm-hmm. I know that sounds weird. Like, how do you go further into the streets to try to get out? But it's like, I looked at it as a, I never was a, the music just, I, the music always met me where I was. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. For the streets, just to touch on this, because I want to be open about Mm -hmm. it, I thought it was my only choice at a certain point in my life. It just seemed like the only... I look back at it now, and I didn't grow up, and I lived in a decently middle-class neighborhood, but I didn't know one person on my street with a career. Right. You know? You you said something in the documentary, which I was really struck by. You were talking about using drugs and being proximate to drug use and how it wasn't abnormal right and that sets a tone if you tell a 14 year old every single person you know is doing this right what do you know how else I don't, could you know? i didn't know anything else everybody did drugs nobody had a career nobody had mm-hmm. a job and it was like you know people that had jobs were really blue collared hard working jobs it wasn't one that you look like oh that's what i want to do sure you know what i mean like my father like, how do i not do exactly that? like mm-hmm. my father was my hero but he was a meat salesman that in early in his career loaded and ran meat trucks. Thankfully, he started selling it and didn't have to m- open his own little company and mm-hmm. did really well for himself. But it was still like, that's not, if that's the most flattering thing happening in this neighborhood, I got to figure something out. Sure. You know what I mean? And I just was like, well, I know it's going to take money to get out of here. And the most obvious way to make money yeah. was what you what was happening in the neighborhood. And it's no excuse, but, you know, it's a, it's a real issue. And it's a, it's just a, it's a, it's just a thing. And it's just kind of what I went to. And, the music just followed Jason wherever wherever old Jelly Roll went. He just drugged the music along like a Santa sack. You know what I mean? And just, when did you start thinking of the music as an actual path out of the lifestyle you had built for yourself that maybe wasn't sustainable? Mm. When did it feel like a real life raft? Yeah, that's a. I don't think I've been asked it that way. That's actually really thank you. Mm. I don't have to think about shit like this that much. I would say that. Initially, I did it as a mean of therapy. I didn't think you could make money from it at all. I didn't think that was an option. And it might have been the first time I sold a CD, the first time I printed up with the intention to sell them. Mm -hmm. Because I would 
print spindles of them up and pass them out in the neighborhood for free. Right. I just had a 10 disc changer in high school. Such a good, fucking good conversation, y'all. Thank y'all for this. I Because I never get to talk about this. I had seen people like Haystack, who yeah. was local, sell CDs. Mm -hmm. Then there was a group called Top Dollar that came up that was like a younger group that was in my neighborhood. And I'd seen them, and they were heavy in high school selling CDs. And then whenever the first time I went in to make probably like a project that I was like, I intend to sell this. Yeah. Maybe the first time I also went in freestyle battle for money mm -hmm. mm -hmm. might have been another real one. Because the first time I made like $1,000, which wow. in the 90s is... sure. Tens, a ten thousand dollars now, or whatever. Mm -hmm, right. I don't know inflation, more, but I know probably. enough to know it's a lot fucking more then than it is now. You know, you want like, a you want a battle as a teenager? Yeah, a few times, man. I want a lot of battles, dude. Do you have a do you have a, a detonator line or yeah. you, that you that you still remember? Where <laughs> oh you're like, no, All right, let, no, let me, dude. Let me I was just out. I remember the ace. the funniest one against me. Okay, let's go, let's go, yeah, let's go. It stuck right. with you. It yeah, stuck wow. with me forever. <laughs> no, I have two times that happened. I'll give you both of them. Let's this go is, in. This is phenomenal. Because I was doing a freestyle battle at the Outer Limits, and uh, a guy named Cahill, who's still a friend of mine, we're friends to this day, and it's the only time I ever lost a battle professionally. Mm -hmm. He said, uh. And this is just context of the era, so I hope this doesn't cause a kerfuffle. But he said, uh, if I put you next to a semi-truck, I bet you way more. This is a black man's sport. Go find a skateboard. Oh, wow. <laughs> and we were in an wow. all-black club. Wow. And they just died. And they, yeah, dude, dude, it's like at that moment, it was like. <laughs> <laughs> and somewhere in Chicago, Lupe Fiasco was like, what? Yeah. What? yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah what? Right? Yeah, for sure. Little Wayne was like, who the is this yeah. guy? You know what I mean? And the other time, I'll never forget because we were in middle school, and to this day, he used the word saunter. Wow. And that caught me. And I didn't know what he was wow. saying at the time. Damn. But he said, You try to run, but you still saunter. Please back up off me, you big titted monster. Wow. <laughs> and this was wow. in the middle school bathroom. I mean, the Damn. middle school lunchroom. Damn, OED boys. Oh, man. And he uh. was an eighth grader, and I was a fifth grader, and he just... Just, just in bed. I mean, it was just late, but yeah, I came. The mirror I don't remember Webster. how. Yeah, really yeah, did. yeah. <laughs> oh, dude, it was crazy, dude. <laughs> but I remember that because I looked up saunter because of that. Sure. I know that word now we'll because it. of that. I literally was in the fifth grade the first time I walked. I'll never forget it. And we were outside the breakfast hall. So, like, for three days, I walked over there and I just kept thinking, when am I going to get in? When am I going to get in? Because they beat on the table with a pencil. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I was like, this is the day. Because I'd already peeped it enough. I'd watched every day to see how it worked. And, like, you would, like, either yo or hey your way in, mm -hmm. like Cypher style. Do y'all yeah. remember hip hop Cypher? Yeah, old enough. Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's somebody be like, hey. A, mm -hmm. A, and then they'd get out of the way on the next bar, which you never interrupted a bar. Like when mm -hmm. I look back, nobody, everybody always came in on the punchline, right. you know? And then one day I, yeah, yo, 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 and I came in and it was like mediocre at best. But the fact, like, no, it was actually probably really horrible. <laughs> it was actually bad, bad. But I just remember people losing their mind. Mm -hmm. And I think back then the stigma of like white rappers wasn't around yet. Like mm -hmm. we hadn't even heard Vanilla Ice at this point. Mm -hmm. So sort of the Beastie Boys or like none of this had really hit, you know, so like this. Right. In Especially all black, in the South. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm in an all black middle school. I'm yeah. like one of 30 white kids in the entire school. So it was like. And this is in Antioch? It was actually in South Nashville. They bust okay. the kids from Antioch. Antioch was really ruled at the time. Like really, really like that's kind of the country part of this conversation. Sure. And how mm -hmm. the music turned into country, too, is like we were already country. As you people. Know, as people. Like yeah. We were already like we were country. Like, you know. Dude, I thought about a one a young buck, a platinum rapper from yeah, Nashville sure, under G yeah. Unit. One of his big singles he had, uh, "You can call me country, but don't call me broke." Mm -hmm. You know, like we were always in. A, and Nashville was small, Bubba. I don't know if y'all know, but Nashville oh, yeah. was like two hundred twenty thousand person town. It's smaller than Columbus, Ohio. We were wondering who, in your opinion is the best rapper from Nashville historically. Yeah. Oh, is it Starlito or is it Kesha? Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> That <laughs> is good. Mm -hmm. Never know what you might run into. What if you ain't had a gun with you? Can't remember when I put it down. Scared my nightmares might come true. It's life fair. No karma's real. Got a dark past on my nerves bed. First of all, this this question was only posed to get me in trouble, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which I appreciate. I mean, like, this is going to be yeah. <laughs> If you're talking best Memphis rappers, that's a real that's, brawl. That's a, yeah. Nashville, yeah. there's not that many options. Yeah. yeah so, well, like, it's like Young Buck had the most success, yeah. so he's automatically there. 
I think Lido had the most like like beautiful thing in the city as far and also as far as like the way Lido goes about his his art yep. is just really Song special. construction, rhyme construction, it's different, storytelling. Man. He's Longevity just yeah, very, of career. Yeah, he's just very he's just 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 thinks a little different. But when we start talking about real Nashville rap, you mm. gotta remember that Pistol signed to Easy E in ninety three. Wow. Right? You got to think. This is yes. different era. I'm I'm not up on that. There has been so much beauty that has came out of the hip hop scene and the culture of Nashville. Mm -hmm. Haystack in his prime was one of the most unique sounds of hip hop I'd ever heard in my life. I feel like the music that's coming out of that center of the country never felt totally beholden to like traditional Los Angeles mm. gangster rap or traditional New York boom bap. Yeah, for and, sure. And I think it forced this business model. Which is like, okay, well, if the majors aren't going to sign us, we're going to make it ourselves. They created DIY. Yep. Uh, Jay Prince, Tony Draper, mm -hmm. Master P, Birdman. I mean, I feel like Southern hip hop was my saving grace in going into country music because I had built a business already. Mm. I had built a channel, a YouTube channel that had a billion views before I signed a record deal. Mm -hmm. wow. I had a couple platinum songs. I had a couple gold songs. Like, I'd already, I'm already selling. 3,000 tickets, four or 5,000 tickets in some markets mm -hmm. everywhere I'm going. Uh, six, seven, when you really get to like the big southern markets at the time. And I'm going into, so I'm walking into a record label feeling like, to them, um, to Nashville, it's like never seen this before at the time. Right. I was going to say, love. like, what did you bring from your rap life into your country music life that's like functioned as secret weapons for you? Oh, like, dude, that hip hop hustle yeah. and ownership. Yeah. Just walking into a building and going, hey, man, I don't want anybody's money in this building. Mm. Nobody has to give me a check. I'm okay. I'm totally fine. What I want out of this building is resources, and this is all I'm willing to give for them. Mm -hmm. And it was just a different mentality. I had a different negotiating power, and I really understood the importance of ownership, like really understood that. I wish artists would really take more time to understand the importance of ownership, like own your masters, license out a percentage, sure. give them whatever you think's fair. Give them a blind share of the pie if you think that's fair for an extended amount of time. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you own the core of these masters and that whatever that share is reverts back to you in a, in a, in a reasonable amount of time. That's you another own your thing last too. two albums? You, 100%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One, I own every song I've ever released. Mm -hmm. Wow. Ever. I do not have a traditional record deal. I am totally still 100% in ownership of my masters. I still get the lion's share of my money on every single facet. Dude, I didn't sign a publishing deal. Mm -hmm. And I'm not bragging, but this is like... I'm proud of myself because a kid that has zero education mm -hmm. didn't get his GED till he was 24 in jail. Just did it because he was having a kid and it scared the shit out of him. Mm -hmm. Last grade completed before that was the eighth. Never made it out of the ninth technically. Mm -hmm. wow. Barely know how to read and write to a degree. Mm -hmm. Figured out this that I can honestly say that I own a hundred percent of the master recordings of my music. And that, so you have this moment during the pandemic when Save Me starts to go viral, right? And then all of a sudden you're welcomed into, I assume, maybe Zoom meetings, but, like, record label meetings yeah. that you've never had before. Did those people go back and do their research and realize how long you'd been at it and that you had this whole career of mixtapes behind you? Or to them, are you, like, a virgin artist guy, coming yeah. out of nowhere? Man, I shouldn't. I don't know. My pub's going to hate me, but I'm going to say <laughs> go this. In. We have guys in country music who are, like, you know, like, obviously are like, hey, man, he's not country enough. Right, sure. Of course. You know what I'm just like? You know, what y'all want me to do? Fuck a goat? Yeah. I don't know how much more country I could be. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, so I have guys in the space who are like, he's not country. And it's like, whatever. They said that about Garth Brooks and of course. Strait. This isn't nothing. They said new. it about every single Everybody person ever who came, came in the and country pushed, and pushed the envelope. And pushed the envelope and changed the every sound time. a little bit. So I'm not bothered by it. But then I go do like, like, you know, like a, like I'm getting to do the jingle balls. Yeah. Because I have a pop radio song, mm -hmm. which is really cool to be so accepted and loved. And it's like, I'm walking around backstage feeling like a redneck i mean i think i just got out of a deer stand i'm talking to everybody you know what i mean it's like i'm talking to everybody and they're just like they immediately are like oh yeah he's country like to them my music couldn't fit anywhere else mm -hmm. right and i'm not talking about the fans in front of the stage no they, no, no, no i think industry. they treat me more like a rock and roll artist yeah. in front of the stage yeah, like it's rock music to them. it's like yeah. yeah this is just awesome no label in town got it right. frankly i mean I, i'm proud to say that now anyone who says they got it is lying jonathan loba from broken bow records got it sure. from bmg he got it Adrian Michaels, who actually brought me to him, got it. Like as a Nashville kid, that's my—that's what I want to do. I mm -hmm. want to play the Grand Ole Opry. You know what I mean? And and lucky for me, 
Morgan Wallen was bubbling at the time. It looked like he had a lot of potential, which he went on to be the just the biggest star on earth, that, which is so deserved. His mm-hmm. music's unbelievable. But Hardy, mm-hmm. Ernest, yeah, who Hardy. was a friend of mine, and Hardy. Sure. So I'm watching the Hicks tape stuff, and yeah. I'm like, like maybe? No, I fit in here. Yeah, yeah that's, that's it. Yeah. That was the moment yeah, I had. I was course. like, yo, I'm, this is I can sneak in right yeah. now. Mm-hmm. I have a chance to th- – there's a moment where I might be understood in this space. Yep. You know what I mean? And it, that's what happened. It's interesting because I think that sets the table. And also, frankly, like all the work Sam Hunt was doing in the 2010s. To well, kind Sam of like Hunt was a things. huge one. The first time I heard Break Up on a Small Town – Mm-hmm. Let's talk about country for a second yeah. and my love for country music. It is my unbelievable favorite. And I can tell you little markers that have happened in the last 20 years that let me know I might be here one day. Yeah, okay. Um, obviously, all the our early Aldine stuff, when especially Dirt Road Anthem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, when there was a full-blown guy rapping on country radio, mm-hmm. you know, like, I remember being like, okay, this is, this has really got mm-hmm. a chance. But when I heard the 808 from Break Up in a Small Town on uh-huh. the Big 98, I think it was, oh, yeah. in Nashville at the time, or 103.3, but I heard it on one of the two country stations, and I remember just, and that was an undeniable 3-6 Mafia-esque mm-hmm. 808. Yep. And the whole, that whole Sam Hunt project, who, you know, Zach Crowell's been a friend yeah. of mine for 20 years. Oh, producer. that makes sense. Okay, yeah. that makes all sense. Produced sure. hip-hop, sold me $100 beats uh, when yep, we were coming we up in the yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, Yeah, that's sold me guy. $100 beats when we were coming up the game. He produced my album, Wits at Chapel. Right. He's, we're really good friends. Mm-hmm. But I just, and I knew he was working on that Sam stuff because so mm-hmm. we were buddies. But to see it actually work, because even when I'm leaving his studio and he's playing me these records, I'm like, good luck. Right. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I know it's banging, you know what I'm saying? But it's like, you know, like, mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. And it was just like these little benchmarks, Brothers Osborne, the yeah. first time I heard mm-hmm. it ain't my fault. Yeah. This, this was like the kind of country that I grew up listening to anyways. Like, in fact, they said Waylon wasn't country. They called Waylon a rock artist in town. It was like all that rocker mm-hmm. posing as a cowboy or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, it started working for Willie. When he let his hair down mm-hmm. and said, and I'll just, give a dude, I'm just an old Texas dude yeah. that just sings the songs I feel. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, like, because they try to do Willie the way they do everybody first and put him of in course. a tuxedo and set him on a stool yeah. and <laughs> slick his hair back. Yeah. You remember this? Did they try to that? give you a makeover? No, no, dude, I was so too lucky. Too far gone. <laughs> it was too far gone. Unmanageable, piece of completely <laughs> off. Dude, this was my philosophy coming into the music game because mm-hmm. of all the inspirations I had. I wanted to put music out like a hip-hop guy. Yeah. And I'll do that in 24. I'll put out a lot of music. Mm-hmm. I didn't do a lot this year because I wanted to focus on a piece of art that meant something. Mm-hmm. And lucky, I was blessed enough that that piece of art, a song from it, was ended up getting a Grammy nomination. Mm-hmm. And that, that did that for me. But I want to I release music like a hip-hop artist. I want to write songs like a country music songwriter because nobody writes more songs than a dude in town that's just getting paid to write them. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And I want to tour like a rock and roll act. You had these humongous hits this year, both Save Me Still and Need a Favor, but I feel like you're crossing over in another way via your speeches. Mm. I mean, oh, yeah. A, the CMA's speech, just incredible. The You saw them put organ over it, the, church, yeah. the Baptist church oh. organ over it. It's the most viral moment of my whole life. Probably yeah. the yeah, best seen... meme I saw this year. Ever. Yeah. We've already had it in the show once. Yeah, we've yeah. already used we'll play it again yeah. right now. Yeah. I don't know where you're at in your life or what you're going through, but I want to tell you to keep going, baby. I want to tell you success is on the other side of it. I want to tell you it's going to be okay. I want to tell you that the windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror for a reason. Because what's in front of you is so much more important than what's behind you. Let's party now. And then I'm thinking about your TikTok after the Grammy nomination. I'm not sure if I'll post this or not because I'm so emotional, but the greatest honor an artist can ever hear is that they've been nominated for a Grammy. You nominated a couple times. Yes. Best new artist. Yes, sir. One probably the the most prolific Best new artist uh, nominee ever. Oh, dude, I'm the second. <laughs> I'm the second oldest. This side of you, where you're willing to be emotional in public, like mm-hmm. the the you know the TikTok, you barely getting through it. You know, choking choking back tears. Like, how are you so comfortable? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like bearing your soul in that way when it's the first time a lot of people are encountering you. 
to me, I'm just still me. So it's like whatever is actually happening in my life is what I'm putting out. But you also make make yourself available to like in the documentary, there's the, the really striking scene with the young woman whose father had been killed. We overcome by the power of our testimony. You have a real strong testimony. Mm, she does. And you're gonna do a lot of good for the world with it one day. You hear me? You cry about it every time you want to. Oh, and, man. But the thing that I'm most struck by in seeing that interaction is, look, we're both interviewed a lot of famous people over the years. I know what it's like to see a famous person go like, that's so terrible, I feel awful for you, hug, disappear. Yeah. That's not what you're doing. Yeah. You're, the eye contact, visibly engaged, visibly emotional, in tears, coming from undoubtedly a pure place and accessing something in yourself, identifying with that depth of tragedy. Yeah. I'm struck by your willingness to be pained by mm-hmm. other people, not simply sharing what you went through, but accepting what other people have gone yes. through. Tell me, like Joe said, like that's, not everybody has that. What is it about you and what you've been through that you think allows you to stand there and be empathetic in those moments and hold the room for that person to feel traumatized and you say, I acknowledge this trauma and I'm there with you. What allows that? Man, I think it's a two, two answer thing. The first answer is, I am, I am an empath for people, period. Mm-hmm. Like, my nature as a human, like, especially for so many years that I wasn't a good human, like, as my heart is soft, and I say this joke all the time, dude, I didn't cry until I was 34 years old. I can't quit crying now. You know what I mean? It's like it was like like when you drink too much beer and you piss the first time. It takes two hours, and you piss every 12 you minutes after seal. that. I broke yeah. the seal, dude. I cannot quit crying. And I just, I I genuinely felt that young lady. It's the only scene I can't watch in that documentary. It's very intense. It's a scene, like, I read an article about that scene and cried reading the article. I believe it. You know what I mean? It's I like it was it. such a vibrating moment to me, and I just feel that pain, and I know what it feels like to be in the darkest moment of your life, man. Like when you remember those feelings deeply and how they affected your life and you see this young lady clearly going through the darkest moment of hers or being open enough to tell me, because I'm a stranger to her besides the music. So, I mean, to me, I'm only matching her bravery here, kind of. She was the one that was courageous enough to come to me and go, I want to share with you what this has done for me. And that just, like you letting your guard down to share that with me means so much. It's one of those things. And to me, that goes to the Grammy thing the grammy post because it's like i'm not going to act like one i'm never going to be too cool to be a fan of something like i think it's so important to still get excited about stuff you the know reba what I mean? moment in the yeah. doc the too right, yeah, like, right? that's pure excitement yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, sure. i don't care where i'm at like i'm gonna yell at reba I don't how much care. i love her no way we love you reba, reba i love, love you so you. much you have no clue my name's jelly roll and i just love you reba Fancy was my Fancy life. was our theme song. I love you, Reba. I might not get to see you. I did. At that moment in my career, yeah. I might not ever see Reba again, dude. You know what I mean? This mm-hmm. might be the only time I ever walk mm-hmm. a red carpet. I'm living that now. Like, this might be the only time I get to come hang out at the f-ing New York Times. You know what I mean? Like, this is like, and I'm going to treat nah, you like coming that. Back. Nah, yeah, you know what <laughs> I mean? <laughs> yeah, I'll be a regular, can I be a regular? <laughs> third? I'll give y'all you ever a cu- need a I'll guest? Give you a cubicle. If one of y'all are out for a day and need me, I'm in. But it's like, I don't mind being that honest to say that, man, that means that much to me. Right. Like being nominated, like, dude, I teared up the other day because I went to a high school football game with my daughter, and I'm, I'm still getting used to this, but there was a clip at the local paper. I made the cover of the local paper the next just day. For going it just to the game. says, Grammy nominated country superstar goes to high school football state championship game mm-hmm. and t- talks about what, you know, me and my daughter going to this game. I didn't do an interview. This just, right. you know, just, somebody just, I didn't know they took a picture of me. I'm still there. I'm there looking like a bum. You know what I mean? And, uh, <laughs> But it's like, to me, I teared up just reading the headline start with Grammy nominated. Yeah, sure. Like, you know what I mean? Like, that's just, you know, my, my wife asked me that day. She was like, what's this mean to you? Why is this? One, I was like, there is no more pinnacle in the music business. Like, when you win a Grammy, Taylor Swift, when she first popped up on the screen at the first Chiefs game, mm-hmm. it said Taylor Swift, like the whole world don't know who she is. She's Michael Jackson. Right. right? <laughs> you know what I mean? And under it, it goes, you know, whatever crazy number, 20 some sure. time Grammy mm-hmm. winner. Grammy Award winner, it's like even just being nominated supersedes every award I've already won. Mm-hmm. As far as like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. the, like that's the headline the rest of my life. 
Grammy it's nominated. I, and and I also was watching, this is Inside Baseball. Mm -hmm. I'm laying there crying with my wife, and she's going, we're looking at every all the other nominees are posting because we're engulfed in this now. Yeah, we're going sure. to check in who everybody is, you know. And uh, she was like, you got to post about this. I was like, too emotional. She's like, when has that stopped you? Right. And that's just a good wife. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? That's just a good wife that's just like you – you go out there and you just just do it. Just try. And I just try. Dude, I have one I haven't released yet. I might post it this week. But I called my mother at the same time of all this. Oh, wow. But it was me getting to call a woman I've called from jail, a woman I've called homeless, a woman I've called addicted, a woman mm -hmm. I've had to come sit down and tell her I had a drug addiction, mm -hmm. a woman I had to come tell her I was running from the police. I mean, a woman I've had to call with all this horrible news. I got to call. So I just got nominated for two f Grammys. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, to me, that is the craziest call you can make. And the funniest part is she's so Southern, she misheard me. So you're going to love this, too. Because <laughs> then it goes from, like, super emotional to just hilarious. Because she's like, you said you got some money? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> a Grammy. And she was like, what'd you say about the family? <laughs> oh, man. That's incredible. And then it was the day after the CMA. So she immediately goes, is why no, no, okay, I love her. <laughs> and then she goes, what about, uh, is Tanya Tucker nice? And, I was like, and she just like immediately moms, starts like yeah. nerdy yeah, the stuff. Right. That, like, what's cool going to be moms. Yeah, yeah, it was just so cool. It was just such a real, That's real incredible. moment. As a person who is relatively new to this degree of emotional transparency, right? At least for this amount yeah, of audience. in this moment in your life, this stretch of time. Is there any part of you that's, saying I should hold back. I should keep some of this for myself. Can I read you something Zach Bryan said to me? Yeah. Because I know you met Zach recently. Love him, by the way. Uh, so I talked to Zach last year, and he said, people don't understand the pressure exerting emotion on other people exerts back on you. Mm. And he was talking about how in, at a certain time that's rewarding and eye-opening and you want to receive it all, but at a certain point, it be begins to take a tiny bit of a toll on, like, how much of myself can I actually make available? Yeah. Has that been a thought process that you've had to go through now that you are, are sharing this amount? I think in my way, I look at it a little different, which I see how Zach looks at it. He's, yeah. he's spot on. But for me, it's like, I think I'm just getting out years of emotion of my life. Sure. Is what's happening. It's like I'm still shaking 30 years of horrible decisions and being a less than uh, attractive human. You know, I mean, I was mean, I was rude, I was disrespectful, I was entitled, I was angry, everybody owed me, you know what I mean? I just just was just such a, just had such a sour spirit. You were mad at the world. I was mad at the world. It was everybody's fault but mine, you know, shake your fist to the man. And, and I learned later that it was me, and I've accepted that, that it was always me, and it's always been me, and that's just, I got to be accountable for everything I do, but... Equally, the exchange of energy with people to me is this. I just want to be useful. Mm. I spent so long feeling, uh, I'm so long not even feeling. I mean, I felt unseen and unheard, but that don't, you know, that's just me, me, me stuff, right? Ego stuff. I spent so long just feeling not of value. Mm -hmm. And that's deeper than ego, yeah. right? That's deeper than the me, me, me stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's like when you just don't feel like you bring any value to any situation, you just kind of carry that with you for so long. And now that I'm in a situation where I am able to be useful, it to me means more than even being happy at this point in my life. You know what I mean? Like at this particular moment, because everybody's not always going to want to care to hear the story and not always care to hear the music the way that it's presented at the time. And I have a moment right now where I'm connecting with people and we're sharing an exchange of energy and we're kind of overcoming these dark things together through this music and through this story and through this journey. And I want to look back at this era more than anything and go, man, that was the wildest five years of my life. I want to look back and go, man, we might have helped millions of people through that, dude. Like yeah. we might have actually touched and helped to some degree millions and millions of people. Do you, do you find like as you're becoming – better known, better known in Nashville, like making connections with people who are established people in the genre. Are you able to form that depth of connection also within your peer group, not simply with fans or admirers or people who are moved by the music, but people who are other well-known singers or other, no other performers? Oh, dude, man, I'll throw a couple of them under the bus. Uh, Cody Johnson and me, yeah. Brantley Gilbert, me, Cody and Brantley. 
I talked to Cody like we were high school friends. Mm-hmm. Like we get vulnerable with each other. Like mm-hmm. people like uh, me and Riley are the same way. Green when they Riley see Green. man, I can't believe that you and Riley Green or you and Cody Johnson went up doing a song together. I was like you don't see the hours of text messages or phone yeah. calls that we've had with each other. Eric Church, sure. that's been like a mentor to me. You know what I mean? When I hit something I don't understand because I'm in the all, I'm in the theater of the unknown. Yeah. Like everything for me is like getting on that elevator with y'all today is mm-hmm. like the new, the most wild thing happening in my whole life is never knowing where I'm going. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like every day for me is like, yeah. what am I walking into? Like, uh-huh. God willing, next time I come back, it'll be like a family reunion. Yeah, right? sure. But like, I'm still the kid out there kind of shaking like, dude, I'm walking into the f-ing New York Times mm-hmm. right now. You know what I mean? Like, it's still, it's so theater of the unknown. So I've been blessed to have this vulnerability with these friends and be able to call them and call Brantley and go, hey, man. What about this? Mm. How did you deal with this? Right. Or the deeper conversations when you call Eric Church and you go, hey, man, I hate to get personal here, but how much do you pay your merch team? Right. That's real. Yeah, that's that's the realest stuff. Yeah. You know, it don't get yeah, there's no, no deeper. There's no, like, playbook. No, yeah. there's no playbook. It's, it's like, yo, like, yo, I'm too, I, new <laughs> level unlocked for me, Eric. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I'm doing. How did you work out your deal on this? Mm-hmm. One thing I love about Nashville I love everything about it, but the tribalness <laughs> yeah. of country music. Oh, for real. It's Always. real. But you would know that more than almost any of your peers because you were literally on the outside of it. Yes. Enforced. 100%. Like Nashville at a certain I was point. A part was of like, the, I was a part of not being able to get literally. in. Literally. Yeah, now it's and like now you're on the, the curse side. has become a blessing because yeah. it's like, so when you do something that represents the genre, they all stand up like, let's go. Right. That's mm-hmm. our guy. You think they're going to vote like that too? Yeah, better. <laughs> Let's Coming see. for Ice Spice? Yeah, right. <laughs> Time in trouble, dude. I think Noah Kahan is a freak of nature. It's and if true. he yeah, wins, and, if, and it's just like I thought Zach Bryan deserved new yeah. artists. Sure. Yeah. I think that if Noah wins it, I'll, I'll, I will stand up and clap harder. So I thought that if I piled something good in all my bad, that I could cancel out the darkness I inherited from dad. No, I am no longer funny because I missed the way you Never met him, never seen yeah. him, don't know anything about him. I hope he's a great human. Yeah. Because I think he's a great songwriter. I want to talk a little bit about the fun stuff that you've gotten to do Ooh, too. Because I, 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 I also so wanted to talk about the fun so stuff. So we saw you on wrestling this week. Our editor, Karen Gans. Shout, yeah, out, shout to Karen. out to Karen. Well, Karen, Karen is a huge wrestling fan. Big wrestling yes, fan. me too. And every every week she's filming her TV for all the greatest highlights yes. and putting them on Instagram <laughs> yes. for wrestling. And all of a sudden I'm scrolling through her stories and I'm like, wait a second, that's Jelly Roll. <laughs> Take us through yeah, that. Through that. You grew up a wrestling fan, I assume. Oh, for sure, dude. Yeah. We went to the wrestling fair. You know, Jeff Jarrett was a Nashville guy, so like very tribal people in our city. <laughs> we uh, we were always cheering for that stuff. And dude, I've just loved it. I've always took it from the playbook. Um, I love their approach. It's just entertainment, man. It's the last of real old school like fun entertainment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like if, back to vaudeville days. Yeah. It's, like, awesome, it's like pure dude. in that it's way. Pure, dude. Yeah. It's like. You didn't see a phone in the building. Mm. Everybody was just eyes on the match. Nobody's mm-hmm. watching it through the screen of their phone. Mm-hmm. Wow. Like, they're present. Mm-hmm. It's really, really cool. The, and I, I just love it. So, uh, Neil Lowey, dear friend of mine, head of music at WWE, been mm-hmm. there 20 years. Yeah. Gave me a chance to do the SummerSlam theme song a couple years ago. Nobody's safe. Tonight is the night. Today is the day. Come on and get ready. The time is right now. Shake up the place from the roar of the crowd. And he's just kept in touch, and he's just always been like, hey, man, if you ever get time, just come out. We'll write you into something. It'll be fun. <laughs> and I was like, dude, I'd love to get involved in a little little scuffle here and there. And they called me and said, we just want you to come backstage and uh, do, a, do a promo about being here, which is what I did, sure. which brought our truth back, which was big for me because I love truth. Mm-hmm. And when he left for surgery, I was like kind of a little sad because I just love everything he brings to wrestling. And I love his music. So I was like, man, this is big to get to do this with truth. The Randy Orton stuff was more just kind of, Cool. Mm-hmm. That, to me, I'm a Randy Orton fan. So when I got to get in the mix and back my dude, you know what I mean? Because Randy Orton's the reason I went. I knew CM Punk was going to be there. I didn't even know our truth was coming back until mm-hmm. they told me, you know, whatever that day. I got so excited. But I knew that CM Punk was talking for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I knew Randy Orton was back on a match. And I was like, let's go. And then I got <laughs> to back Randy. It was even cooler, dude. That's a- incredible. Another fun thing that I was, that I'm very interested in. Uh, let's talk. 
Oh, is jewelry. this icebox? Stop it. Yes, it is. Is this uh, icebox? Yes, icebox. icebox. Yeah. Okay, so the icebox. Yeah. Okay, so I shout out Mo, shout out Rafi, yeah, shout out Zahir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Mo had texted me a few weeks ago. He was at the CMAs and yeah. he was like, "I'm, you know, Jelly is." Big. And I was like, "We're talking." I, I, I had not seen the icebox. I, hadn't, I didn't know you had done icebox oh, videos. Yeah. And then I went back and watched, and I was like, very excited. All okay. right, yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, man, and that safety latch is nice, huh? Oh, 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 this is my <laughs> moment, though, baby. I've been waiting on this. Yeah. <laughs> it's the last piece of the puzzle. Whew. Man. How'd that look on me right there, baby? Do I look like a man that's been working hard? Yeah. <laughs> Tell me a little bit, because to me, that's something that's a slice of the culture surrounding being a star that you have access to that probably most of your peers in Nashville don't have. A, like, yeah. I'm not sure we're going to see. I mean, I would love to see a hearty... Icebox video. Yes. You, know, you got to bring Wallen. Wallen, Icebox. get a Wallen video. Yeah. <laughs> but like, they're probably not there yet. But you Mo can and Wallen do both. swapped numbers at the BMI Awards. Did Mo they? came to me and said, Hey, I'm finna Incredible. go meet your boy. That's a scoop. Yeah, That's it's a, a true story. Mo <laughs> yeah. came to me and said, I'm finna go over there and introduce myself to your boy. I said, Yeah, just to be Morgan's the homie. So I was like, Yeah, just, you know, he's going to know who you are. Mm -hmm. And he was like, If I need you to come co sign me, will you come? I'm like, Bro, I'm telling you, Morgan's yeah, hip. Like, know. Morgan loves hip hop. Sure. Like, loves hip hop. And uh, so I was like, like as much as I do, like real nerds out He's about got old more songs mixtapes. With Lil Durk than you do. <laughs> he got the OTF chain. Yo, he got the OTF yeah, chain. I was true. insanely jealous. I was like, dude, I love my friends. I'm never jealous of like watching Morgan win all those Billboard awards. I was like, he earned it. Go Morgan. Mm -hmm. The only jealousy I ever have with my friends is when they get to do something way cooler than anything I get to do. <laughs> and I watched him get an OTF chain put on his neck, and I was just like. <laughs> I was like, I bet Jay, I want Jay Prince to give me a rap a lot. Chance. Yes. So like, <laughs> but this is an okay. Re these are okay replication. Uh, yeah, okay. It's a great feeling. Yeah, the chain that I wore. He was actually delivering the uh, that crucifix I had made just for the CMAs mm -hmm. that I wore that night. That crucifix was an icebox piece. So, dude, like I said, I'm a hip hop fan, man. That's I love that. You know, I've been watching the Icebox Channel forever. You're a YouTube fan and an Icebox fan. Who's your favorite Icebox video? Yeah, what's yeah? Let's talk good Icebox videos. Oh, dude, they've had so many good ones. I, I love anything with Baby in it. But these we got ribs. All right. Yeah, that's real meat. Yeah. Oh, me. No baby eats ribs at Icebox. Oh, me. <laughs> Nobody, nobody in the eyeball. I, I, knew, I just I love, like, yeah, his baby like, ones are like, so great. The baby ones they're, are great. He's so comfortable there. He's so comfortable. <laughs> it's, it's just like his like, living room. It's so his house. They shut it down for him. Mm -hmm. He just kind of sits down like he doesn't have a care in the world. Mm -hmm. the, the, my favorite one is when they gave him all of the, um, what are they called, appraisals that mm -hmm. he had forgot to get. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was like a book. Mm -hmm. It was like <laughs> 70, 80 pages of just appraisals. Must be, must and be I nice. was like, dude, I've got like... Two chains and a bracelet, mm -hmm. and they're very smaller side of their business. Sure. Like I'm like just more of a novelty act. They just love me for me, and I love them for them. Right. I'm not like spending a bunch of money there, but to think about how I feel about having the little bit I have, yeah. and then watching baby just get like handed a hundred <laughs> sheets of hundred two hundred thousand like dollars plus to, send millions this to the of insurance dollars company. Yeah. of appraisals, and I was like my butt puckered. You know what I'm saying? I was I broke a little sweat. I was like ooh. Because luxury is a very expansive concept. How much of that is about family? I mean, you've got two children. You have a wife who's a podcaster. Yeah. yeah. Shout out to Bunny. Shout yeah. out to podcaster. Fellow she podcaster is, Bunny. She is, man. And her podcast was one of the top 15 on Spotify this year. Wow. Crazy. It's crazy. So crazy. Ta talk to us about the opportunities that you provide that were not provided to you. The only problem with this is, and this is the vulnerability that gets me in trouble, is it's hard to call anything a luxury in that regard because you're missing the most important luxury, which is the time, time. with the right. children. And it's like, we're, I mean, I'm missing it. Yeah. Like, no doubt about it. Like, I slept in my bed 39 days this year or something. So, you know, I mean, dude, we, we live a, a, a life that I experience decades of memories in a year. Sure. Mm -hmm. Amplified. Decades, yeah. For amp, like, memories that are like, I'm starting to write down stories now yeah. and put them to the side in case this continues to get this crazy, that mm -hmm. some of the crazier stories get less crazy, but right. it's still crazy. You know what I'm saying? That I want to be able you gotta to look be back like Drake. on. You got to have yeah. like a yeah. constant note taking. Yeah. Of like, of like, this is like, I'll make notes literally in my phone where I'm like, don't forget this. Right. Like, I'm curious in a bigger picture. I, I think about this a lot with artists who convey profound amounts of struggle and pain in their music. Mm. So much of this album is about 
it, it really does feel like an emotional bloodletting. And that's obviously what's gravitating, that making people gravitate to it, it's what make, making people share these stories with you. But your life is evolving. Right. Your life's changing. Your experiences, these memories you're talking about, yeah. the last 12 months of memories are fundamentally unlike anything that you've experienced before. When you go back for the next album, I, I mean, I was going to say album two, but it's really like album like 19. Yeah. But you know, when you go back for the next album or the one after, the one after it, are those textures that are on this album, is that still what you want to be delivering? Or do you think that there's a different emotional version of Jelly Roll that three to five years from now is what's going to be in the music? Yeah. Or is it always going to be save me, need a favor, struggle, struggle I think there's more Rod of a balance. Wave records. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I think that's what I love him. Yo, Jelly Roll Rod so Wave good. album? Go Dog. crazy. That Yo, they said it could end racism on Twitter. I didn't <laughs> say that. Twitter oh, wow. said that. That's, I didn't the Jelly I Roll Rod Wave album. No. That go dummy. Yeah. Todd. Yeah. Todd, pick up the phone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a big one, dude. I would I'd be honored. I think that it'll always be a mix of where I'm at and where I what what I still see. Because what did what hasn't changed this year is that Davidson County had the second highest overdose. Uh, uh, in America, yeah. overdoses in America. That's my city. That's Nashville. It was yeah. in America, the second of all metropolises. Um, I'm still deeply plagued and affected by the epidemic of drugs. So I'm never letting what's happening with the blessing of this thing working for me take me away from who I know I'm actually speaking to and for. Now, what will happen in the next album that I see happening is there's a lot of those songs that still touch that, a lot of my own dark demons, because as jovial as I am in real life, the music is a reflection of there's a very, very dark hallway between my ears. It's the scariest place on earth for me. I dread going to sleep every night. The ghosts are there. But equally, I'm going into my eighth year of marriage, and I've never been more in love. Yeah. So it's like I got a couple love songs on the new album that Good. I think are really true to who I am. Plus, I just want a big wedding song. There you go. I've had so many funeral songs. My music has always been so driven in that that the other side of that, I want to showcase that a little bit because there are highs in life, too, and I want to figure out a way to incorporate them in the music. But ultimately, you know what I write about. You know who I write for. Never had any rap songs for Bunny? Yeah, Wheels Fall Off. Okay. Yeah, but it was very where we were then. You know, me and Bunny were still eight ball of cocaine a day. Yeah, wow. At the time, you know what I mean? So Bunny's completely... That's an expensive habit. It's a crazy, crazy lifestyle, man. And Bunny is, um, of course, completely sober. 100% sober. And I'm California sober, and I'll still have a cocktail. Mm -hmm. But I'm long removed from the hard drugs, the codeine that I drank when I was with her. When we first got together, the Xanaxes, the pain pills, the cocaine. I let all the cocktail of that go. I'll still celebrate with a tequila every now and then and mm -hmm. smoke me a little reefer. But um, that's how old I am. I still call it Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> so it feels on some level like a moral responsibility for you when you look at the folks out there in the crowd and the folks who are backstage. You can't switch up. For like, sure. literally, like, even if you woke up and you're like, damn, I really want to switch up. I really want to be different. I really want to be Hollywood. I really, you know you can't yeah. because those people are holding you accountable in, like, a good way. Not in, a like, tisk tisk way, yeah. but in a good way. That's For how it sure. feels. Yeah, 100%. To me, I feel like it's more of, like, man, I'm holding myself accountable, too. Like, I yeah. know that, man, when I seen that statistic about Nashville, it made me think about the song She... And why yeah. it was so important for me to release that record, it was yeah. like just remembering that God gave me a chance to be a voice for the voiceless. Those who I say that all the time, but it's real. Like a group of people that have never really been spoken for in mm -hmm. pop culture, in, right, in, in the music, mainstream, in mainstream yeah. media, and mainstream music. Like, and it's proven that there's a mainstream audience for that because if 15 people an hour are overdosing and dying in the United States of America every hour mm -hmm. due to drugs, and that number is increasing by. 12 to uh, 7 to 12 percent every single year it's inevitable that multiple people in this building have been affected by that to some sure. degree it's inevitable because what i've learned about drugs and i didn't know this when i was selling drugs i thought drugs was a victimless crime mm. then you start seeing the grandchildren of addicts are affected the children of addicts are affected the mothers sisters uncles aunts like i forgot the quote but it's something about uh the entire family suffers from one addict. Of course. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, For I forgot sure. there's a quote in the, in the program that talks about that. But it's crazy. It's like I look at that kind of stuff, you know? And that's what I'm always going to try to write towards and for. I want to make sure that that is, group of people is spoken for. I want to ask you a bit of a broader question. 
What is it about white rappers? <laughs> Wherever this is going, I'm happy. <laughs> all ending up making rock music at some point. Like right? you think of Post Kid Malone, Kid Rock, Kid Rock. You yeah. know, uh, MGK, Machine Gun Kelly yeah. lately. You know, it was one like, of the most biggest inspirations whenever I started uh, dabbling into the multi genre stuff. Sure. Yellow Wolf. His success was yeah. clearly a, yeah, yellow. Another collaborative of yours. Even mm-hmm. Eminem, Eminem, to some extent, like, like big, is more of a. The uh, big late career yeah. Eminem records. He's not singing, but they are rock in scale For and sure. production. Yeah. Like, yeah, do you feel like that's. Is there something where folks who started out, white, white rappers started out and say, it's unseemly to be a 40 year old white rapper and then rock is an available thing why do you think that people make that pivot so frequently i think well i can't speak for i think i'm sure it's based on an individual thing sure i know me and mgk share the spirit of we both were just influenced by rock music like mgk's early stuff he always referenced himself as a rock star he always rock and roll closed like he like that half naked, almost famous doc was oh, yeah. like, you seen the evolution of the rock star coming. Mm-hmm. I actually think it came later than I thought it would. Mm-hmm. I thought we were going to see that from Kells way earlier, to mm-hmm. be honest. So, yeah. and to see that his heart is still so hip hop that he's turning right around and working on a hip hop record right yeah. now. I mean, he's, he is bold. Dude. I don't know if I'll ever put out another rap project. Yeah. I was going to say, it's not even anymore? in my thought process. Yeah, it's I just not it. even where I'm at in my head. So watching him do it, it's like, I've low key wrote a couple raps just watching him. You know what I mean? Just being like, yo, maybe I might still have it. You know what I mean? Would you put out a rap record? Because I wonder, now that the scale of success of this album, there are now expectations that come on the back of the scale of success that you're experiencing. Yeah, to follow it up. But, like, not to be like Andre 3000 should rap again, but, like, people, you know, it's like, you still could have bars. Yeah, you could put a verse on a a country album. Yeah, for sure. Is that... No, I think I'll still guest feature here and there. I mean, I got a rap record I'm thinking about doing with the Mexican OT. He sent me one. It's crazy. I love him, by the way. I think he's so good. Um, That he wants me to rap on. The Jesse Murph record I kind of rapped on a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And that was Jesse's request, by the way. I'm attracted to things that are really crazy. Asking me how I've been feeling lately. Coming from mine, then this do or die. I won't let it slide. No stealing bases. No back and forth bargaining. No bitching and argument. A whole lot of problems. Living in Gotham. And Bun is my Holly Quinn. Quinn. Was raised in the darkness. Forgive me, I'm God. I have no shame. I'm in love with the hardness. The police will never take us alive. But no, my, my heart is like, I'm so in love with songwriting right now. Mm. Like, I'm just so, I've wrote a hundred something songs this year. Wow. Like, I think it's inevitable next year that I get multiple cuts that aren't, that are my songs that I didn't Oh, sing. that you're going to give to others. Yeah. 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 I think it's inevitable because stuff that's like, yeah, it's just not Jelly Roll, but I felt it that day and wrote mm-hmm. it. And, you know, it's just not for Jelly Roll, the artist, but I, somebody could still be the vessel for the song. But yeah, it's like I'm just so in love with songwriting right now. I just couldn't imagine it going any other way. But that said, I mean, you are maybe the only person who's ever walked in this room, famous or not, who looked at that wall and knew exactly who the people were on that wall. Yeah, for sure. Thank and you. like understands the importance of having, you know, like yeah. that understands what Yams meant to the culture, what Pete meant to the culture, yes. you know, like, and so that's still in you. For this sure. Because these are younger folks than you. 100%. These are people who are two I'm, three I'm generations watching, after. I love NLE Choppa. Yep. Right now. I love I love Dirk. I love mm-hmm. what young boy's doing. Like mm-hmm. I I love it. I think it's innovative. I think sometimes that it's so innovative, it's it's sometimes it, well, NLE streams, but like sometimes mm-hmm. songs will miss that I think should have hit because yeah. I think it's ahead of its time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I think these dudes are playing on a playing the game at a different level. Like I'm still completely nerded out about rap. You know what I mean? I'm sure. still listening to every Drake album Drake drops mm-hmm. as soon as it comes. I mm-hmm. still I think he's the I think he's Michael Jackson of I think him yeah. and Taylor. I think he's Michael he's Prince yep. of mm-hmm. hip hop. Like it's over. Like he's gonna break every record ever. He is the greatest to ever do it. He's the only person that will ever eclipse Eminem ever. It'll it, never happen again in hip hop. We are we are watching it and we should appreciate it. It's that special. Also, like you talking about showing up on the Jesse Murph record and being like, I'm kind of spinning on this record. You're probably the only guy working in Nashville right now who could reasonably sing features and rap features. Yes, yes. So you could be. Speaking of Drake. Yeah, yes, that's what I'm Drake. saying. Give me like, a call, you could do that. No, and, and the thing that I've actually been struck by is, you know, in the 2010s when people like Sam were trying to figure out, like, how do I make country a little bit more hip hop they were doing these like kind of like musical alchemies that like kind of like halfway maybe didn't totally solve the problem but i was struck with you with such a bona fide rap career that this album is 
complete it's it's a totally different version of you but yes. you are in fact the most hip hop guy to be in Nashville. Yeah, for you just sure. did not make a record yeah. that has that uh, it's in you it's just not the songs. Right. But do you see at some point in the future trying to like harmonize all that in some future version of yourself? I think what my dream would be right now is if in 2024 I could become like what Nate Dogg was yeah. in the <laughs> early, you know what I mean? Like th to me, that would be Let's cool go. in hip hop, right? Let's like go. if I could sprinkle in four or five really big features, like Bruno had that big run in hip hop mm -hmm. early in his career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like not that I don't want to. Mm, let me pick my words wisely here. I don't want to say I owe it to hip hop, but I feel like I owe it to hip hop. Yeah, I hear you. Like you know if that makes sense, and my love wants to do it. I just I don't want to say genre fluid. Yeah, yeah. But it's uh, I just want to be able to make the music I want to make, and regardless, I'm gonna be country, because I promise you, I hadn't talked to one hip hop dude that doesn't think I'm a country artist. Yeah. I was gonna you say, what what I mean? your, like, you know what, what I mean? Do your Does that rap make sense? Friends think of your yeah, country that's music great success. Question. Oh, they love it, dude. They think it's great. They think I finally found myself. You know, they like they I found my voice. Yeah. Because I think the bars were always there and the writing was always there, but I don't think I had a really cool rapping voice. I think that's kind of what held me back the most. But I think I have a really good, not even, I don't think I have a good singing voice. I don't think I'm a good singer. There's a, there's a, there's a quote for you. I think I am a convicted singer. Mm. And I think you hear that. Mm. I think there is, there is, it's in like all that. Senses. It's like that, Zach, in all senses, <laughs> right? Right? Pow, pow, pow. <laughs> but it's like the Zach Bryan thing where it's yeah. like, it's like the Willie Nelson thing. Yeah. Zach Bryan thing. It's the Jelly Roll thing. You it's believe like, it. We hear you, you believe, we it. believe like it. Like you, it don't yeah. matter how much Willie, maybe I always love you. Yeah. Right through that nose. It's like, you just were like, oh my, rip my heart out, please. You know what I mean? It's like, it's what I hear every time I hear a Zach Bryan record. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm like, God, I'm in the best marriage ever. But today, God, I'm thinking about that girl from high school. Yeah, <laughs> you know sure. what I mean? It's like that's what he does. One of the last things I wanted to touch on before we get to Snackland is, okay, you said something in the documentary. There's like the thing at the end where you're at the press conference talking about donating equipment for the juvenile facility yeah. for a music program and things like that. And, what, and you talked about... I wish I could show some of my Nashville peers what's happening in this city, mm. the other part of the city. You're the rare country star who's actually from the town or yes. from nearby. Exactly. Yes, a sir. lot of folks, they're from somewhere else, and they came to Nashville to become stars. Right. You were in Nashville the whole time. For sure. Yeah, um, absolutely. Have you had that opportunity to take folks who don't see the other side of Nashville and be like, Actually, let me show you a little bit about what this is about. You know what? Because, like, that town, this town is built on the back of this other thing. For sure. No, dude, for the record, so many country dudes in that genre, so many people in different genres called immediately and was like, yo, I want to go to the juvenile. Wow. Like, take me to jail with you. Like, it was, it's been overwhelming that I've never called one single artist in Nashville to do something for the juvenile mm -hmm. that didn't say yes immediately. Great. No hesitation. In music, they have the tendency of people to show up with a guitar and think they're doing charity work. Yep. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, I I just wanted to express the challenge of, like, come in here and serve food. What I felt is you wanted those people to understand that then when they're out in the world representing Nashville and country music, that there's a whole other part of that that should be in the back of their minds. Dude, and you wanted to show it to them. One of my favorite, the biggest compliment I received the night I won that CMA award was one of the producers backstage grabbed me and he said, you're the only artist tonight that won, that when you won, everybody in the front of house, all the, the music people cheered, mm -hmm. stood up for you. All of the 13,000 fans they let in stood up for you. And he said, but that's not special. That's pretty special. But what's special is the local 46 union back yeah. here lost their shit. There you go. He said, it's the only time all night they showed that they even knew what was happening during the show. Mm -hmm. You know, because these are workers. They're not paying yeah. attention. He said, they jumped up out of their chairs. They high five. They clapped for you. He said, the media room cheered. Yeah. He said, the most unbiased people on earth cheered for you. Like, mm -hmm. their job is to not be biased. Yeah, yeah. And couldn't hold it. They were just good for him, just mm -hmm. immediately. He said, it's the only time all night I heard that from all three of these sections. Sure. And I just take honor in that because that goes back to the Nashville thing of like, I'm doing it for the local 46. I'm doing it for the local news reporter that's been reporting there for 20 years. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm doing it for, they've seen the city how I have. 
I'm doing it for the bartender and the bar back, like we spoke about earlier. Mm-hmm. That's the backbone of Broadway. Yeah, Broadway is service the workers. Sign, yeah. dude. It's the service workers, dude. Yeah. It's the bartender, yeah, yeah. It's dude. Not it's the, the barkeep. It's, it's the security the... dude. Mm-hmm. It's gonna be just ha- just. He knows he's gonna be in for a long night. He walked there and showed up that way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like these are the people that like this is the city, and then you go a block over. And you will see extreme poverty like yep. every other city in America. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like this town that the music you love coming from, it is also a city that's got a bunch of really hard working people. You know what I mean? That that are that are that they, like you said, that Nashville was built the, on mu- the music row was built on, on the, their back. Exactly. Great way to put that. Should we eat a snack? We should snack, dog. <laughs> so every week uh Popcast Deluxe, we sample a snack. Jelly Roll walked into the studio. We gave you some options from around the world, in fact. Global. It's a yeah. global We gave you some. Week, there were some classic options. There were some rare options, some limited edition, some holiday flavors. And without hesitating, you said the pandas. Yes. Shout out. This came from my local supermarket in, like, the good candy aisle or oh, the yeah. good okay. package aisle of my local supermarket. So these are vanilla-flavored Hello Panda Cream center with a crunchy shell. Oh, you've had these before. You I've haven't. never had. So I've had the chocolate, the you've dark the chocolate, chocolate ones. and the strawberry also. I I've never had okay. the strawberry, but the dark chocolate one is a frequenter on the bus. Okay. Ooh. So what y'all didn't tell this, what Popcast does, they don't tell you is they forget to tell you. They don't tell you what it's for. They just put a bunch of snacks out <laughs> and get you excited. <laughs> they want to see, so you pick genuinely, and mm-hmm. you're just like, dude, I didn't hesitate. I was like the pandas. Yeah. They were uh, like, you sure? Right. I was like, and no doubt. The I'm pandas. also glad. You know, it's the holiday season. We're gonna get to New Year's resolutions. You're a little bit. Hollywood now, but we're catching you while yeah. you're still snacking. Yeah, you're for still sure. Snacking right? hard. I'm still allowed like, to snack on no, camera. No, we're not doing green juice. Yeah, yeah. We're not doing green juice. Yeah, we're that's doing, right. We're doing junk food. Grab a little handful. You go first. All right. And then we give a score out of ten. Oh, I love writing stuff. Is that like a handful? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's good. good. I love the smell. Mm. It's like neutral, but like like cookies. Cookies are baked. Oh, 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 oh. I know it. You smelled the bag though. It's just it's, it's like you smell the dust. You know, like a cookie uh, has like a tiny bit of dust I like on that, it. Though. It's like you're smelling the dust. Mm. I could eat a lot of these. Is That's what interesting. I'll say. That's the problem with them. That's yeah. interesting. The outer cookie is a lot less imaginative than the sweetness of the filling would let you think it is. Mm. Yeah, they're definitely counting on the filling to do the work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, and they're in like shapes too. Like I like a little like a ghost little... Pac Man. Go- no, I know, but it's like ghost of Pac Man. Oh, yeah, they're all it's different shapes. I just noticed that. <laughs> oh, it's I a, had it upside down. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was like a ghost. It's what about that one? That's not a bear, right? It's, it's a panda. panda. <laughs> it's it's Look on the, back of the, on the back of oh, the I thing. I get it, but check this out. That one looks like a panda, right? Yeah. Well, that one just looks like a ball. Yeah. I think, I think these are delicious. Yeah, the quality control, they got to... You want some more? I will try. The yeah, the quality is control, they got to... Yeah. We always tell the food scientists they got to, like, yeah. tighten the ship. To me, these are extremely edible in the in the sense and like they're not quite sweet enough to stop me from eating the whole bag yeah like i could i would keep chasing i would keep chasing the sweetness i think i could eat that entire thing probably in the right circumstance i like these a lot i'm gonna go eight on this yeah i feel like it's a solid eight like again i'm starting to see to your point the neutrality of the cookie as a bit of an asset Mm because you have a neutral cookie a sweet center Mm-hmm. And then you don't want to have something sweet immediately after that. You want, like, another barrier to the sweetness. You're kind of mm-hmm. like neutral sweet, neutral sweet, I think neutral sweet. I think it's very well balanced. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go I'm gonna go seven and a half okay. out of ten. I'm going to buy the other flavors, too, when I get home. I'm yeah. going to go eight just because I think the chocolate ones are eight and a half. The okay. chocolate's a little more... Like the vanilla leaves you lingering. Mm. The, leaves want, like you said, maybe, it's a, maybe that's an asset. It makes you want a little more. Where when you eat the dark chocolate ones, that dark chocolate's so thick. Mm. It kind of really sits, but I can fuck up a bag of these two. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, that, what the real move is a mix and match, ball, mix and match. Yo, dump and them then, all. Oh, and, yeah, Super and Bowl then you party, don't know which one you're gonna get. Them. Yeah. Oh, all right. that's genius. Yeah. Next time, yeah, mm. for the holiday party season, or if the Meiji Corporation is watching, you should just pre bag them that bag. way, and then for yeah, sure, go the mixed bag. Because mm-hmm. imagine if you had a you know, ham, you have two yeah. or three of them. You never yep. know what you're getting. Yep. It's a joy. I love it. Um, Jelly roll. What a fucking time. What a pleasure. Right? Yeah. No, dude, I want to thank you. I, I want to give you all flowers because I'm big on that. I think it's important. I think it's really cool. Because I grew up in the magazine era, mm-hmm. I've always been a fan of old school journalism. Like, I love the depiction. I love mm-hmm. writing. I just, I love it. And to see it transition and to have, like, these kind of conversations and see it on a podcast, but with two real lifelong journalists, mm-hmm. it's really dope. 
I appreciate it. I man. think it's really special. It's like, to me, f- this is awesome, dog. Yeah, you know what I mean? You. So, it means cool. a lot. Thank, y'all. thank you goal. so much for joining us. We appreciate us. that yeah. you are down and, and see the vision. Yeah. Jelly Roll said subscribe to Popcast channel on YouTube, youtube.com slash Popcast. Listen, that's let me do this show. for you. Subscribe to the Popcast channel. That's youtube.com forward slash Popcast. But don't only subscribe. Subscribe, like, comment, please. Share. Love y'all. Look at that. Um, every episode ever of Popcast is at nytimes.com slash Popcast. Subscribe, youtube.com slash Popcast. Uh, audio, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, wherever you get your audio and audio visual content. Um, dog, email us, Popcast at nytimes.com. Get in the Discord. Get in the Facebook. It's tinyurl.com slash Popcast Facebook slash Popcast Discord. Um, our producer, MIA today, but our producer, senior producer is Sawyer Roque. In the room producer is Pat Gunther. Editor is Jamie Heffett. Special thanks, as always, to Leslie Davis, Nell Galogli, Karen Gans, Pedro Rosado. It's me. It's Joe. It's Jelly Roll. We're out. We're back next week. Peace.